We'll start this lesson off by talking about the types of Hyper-V that you'll find in the various Windows Server 2012 editions. Now, there are four different editions of Windows Server 2012. These are commercial editions, so these are all editions of Windows Server 2012 that you have to pay for. In other words, they aren't free. I'll talk about the free version of Microsoft Hyper-V in just a minute. If we start off with the foundation version of Windows Server 2012, this is only available when you purchase a new server from an original equipment manufacturer or an OEM. For example, if you purchased a server from, let's say, Dell or HP, you could have the foundation edition of Windows Server 2012 included. However, the foundation edition offers no rights to run additional Windows Server 2012 virtual machines inside, and even worse off, it doesn't even allow you to run Microsoft Hyper-V. So the foundation edition is off the table if you want to use Microsoft Hyper-V. Moving on up, the next edition of Windows Server 2012 that you can purchase actually directly from Microsoft in this case is the Essentials Edition. However, it also has the same limitations with no virtualization rights and no ability to run Microsoft Hyper-V inside. The first edition of Windows Server 2012 that you're able to use Microsoft Hyper-V as a role inside is the Windows Server 2012 Standard Edition. And it also includes virtualization rights for you to run two Windows Server 2012 virtual machines inside. That way you don't have to purchase additional licenses for the first two Windows Server 2012 virtual machines that you run on a physical server using Windows Server 2012 Hyper-V if you're licensed for the standard edition. And then finally, the fourth edition of Windows Server 2012 is Windows Server 2012 Data Center. Now, it's quite expensive, but it also includes unlimited virtualization rights. That means that you can run as many Windows Server 2012 virtual machines that your server can support. So if you had a physical server that had lots of RAM and lots of CPU capacity, you could run as many Windows Server 2012 data center virtual machines inside of that physical server as the server could provide resources for. To sum it up, there's four different editions of Windows Server 2012, Foundation, Essentials, Standard, and Data Center. However, only the last two editions, Standard and Data Center, allow you to use Microsoft Hyper-V. So if you want to use Microsoft Hyper-V, make sure that you have one of these two editions, either Standard or Data Center. With those Windows Server 2012 editions, you can install the Hyper-V role either using the graphical user interface or via the command line using PowerShell. And I'll be showing you how to install Microsoft Hyper-V as a role in Windows Server 2012 step-by-step -step here in just a few minutes. But first, let's talk about two other ways that you can utilize Hyper-V. One way is Hyper-V Server 2012. This is a completely free edition of Hyper-V Server. And it's very similar to Windows Server Standard Edition if you installed it in the core mode with no local graphical user interface. However, Hyper-V Server 2012 offers no virtualization rights, and it can only be used to run the Hyper-V Server role. So you can't use Hyper-V Server to perform other traditional Windows Server functions, but it does make a great way to get started learning about virtualization and testing Hyper-V in your lab environment. The free edition of Hyper-V Server 2012 even offers many of the advanced features that you'll learn about in this video training series on Windows Server 2012 Hyper-V. Make sure you watch my lesson on getting started with the free Hyper-V Server 2012. Now, another way to use Hyper-V is called Client Hyper-V. This is a special version of Hyper-V that you can enable in the Windows 8 desktop operating system on your laptop or desktop computer. Client Hyper-V is very similar to the old Microsoft Virtual PC, but much higher performance because it's a real Type 1 hypervisor, just like Windows Server 2012 Hyper-V. Client Hyper-V is even compatible with Hyper-V in Windows Server 2012 so that you can easily move virtual machines back and forth from Client Hyper-V in Windows 8 to Windows Server 2012 Hyper-V in the data center. Now let's move on and talk about the hardware requirements to install Windows Server 2012 Hyper-V. Now, if you look at the official Microsoft minimum requirements to use Windows Server, they are 1.4 gigahertz of CPU capacity on a 64-bit CPU, just 512 megabytes of RAM, 32 gigabytes of disk space, 
and then things like a DVD drive, Super VGA, mouse, keyboard, and internet access. Of course, we all know in the real world, no one's going to be installing Windows Server 2012, whether or not you're using Hyper-V on a server with so little capacity and resources. A real-world Hyper-V server is going to have multiple multi-core 64-bit CPUs with the Intel VT or AMD virtualization technologies built in. You'll have 8, 16, or 32 gigabytes of RAM, even more, perhaps, installed on that real-world Hyper-V server. You'll have local storage or perhaps connectivity to network-attached storage or a storage area network, such as Fiber Channel, iSCSI, or a new Windows Server 2012 host running the new SMB3 protocol. Additionally, you'll have multiple network interface cards, all running at gigabit Ethernet speeds or greater. That's the kind of real-world Hyper-V server that you'll be using in production with Windows Server 2012 Hyper-V. Now, I briefly mentioned the Intel VT or AMD V virtualization technologies. These are specific features built into CPUs. The Intel VT and AMD V virtualization technologies allow the CPU to work with a virtualization hypervisor, such as Microsoft Hyper-V, to give it much better performance than ever before possible. Another feature of the CPU that's also required is called DEP, or Data Execution Prevention. Both Intel VT and AMD V, depending on what brand of CPU you have, and DEP are required to be enabled in the BIOS to be able to utilize Microsoft Hyper-V. Now, there's been some confusion on something called SLAT, which is Second Level Address Translation. This is also a feature of CPUs, and it's not required to run Windows Server 2012 Hyper-V unless you're using virtual desktops that are utilizing the remote desktop protocol. However, SLAT is required for client Hyper-V in Windows 8 on your local desktop or laptop computer if you want to use Hyper-V. So now we've reached the point in this lesson where we can get started installing Hyper-V in Windows Server 2012. Here we are after a default installation of Windows Server 2012. To add the Hyper-V role, we'll actually go down here to the Start menu or press the Start button. We'll bring up Server Manager, which typically starts by default after you install Windows Server 2012. To add the Hyper-V role, we'll go here to Number 2, Add Roles and Features. However, if this is hidden, you can always go up to Manage, and then down to Add Roles and Features. This brings up the Add Roles and Features wizard. Notice here that the destination server is Hyper-V1. That's our local server. This tells us here that this is the wizard that's going to help us to install roles, services, or features. I'll click Next here because we want to do a role-based or feature-based installation, not a remote desktop services installation for VDI. Now we're asked to select which server we want to install this new role on. And again, I'll take the default here by clicking Next because we've already selected our destination server. That's our local server, Hyper-V1. Now we're asked which role we'd like to install on this local server. Of course, in our case, we're learning about Hyper-V. I'll be checking the box here next to Hyper-V that tells me it's also going to be adding a few features along with the Hyper-V role and that's the Remote Server Administration Tools, which include the Hyper-V module for Windows PowerShell and the Hyper-V Graphical User Interface. Of course, I want those tools, so I'll just take the default here and click Add Features. Notice that the checkbox for Hyper-V here is still selected. I'll click Next. We're asked if we want to install any additional features on this server along with Hyper-V. Notice that the Remote Server Administration tools are already checked as these are the tools we'll need to administer the new Hyper-V server locally. I'll click Next here. And at this point, we'll be asked a few questions about this new Hyper-V installation. I'll click Next. And now we're being asked about creating virtual switches for Hyper-V. Virtual machines require virtual switches to communicate with one another and with other servers out on the network. The Hyper-V installation wizard recommends we create one virtual switch now so that we'll be ready right after the installation to start creating and connecting virtual machines to the network. To create our first virtual switch, all we have to do is check the box here 
next to our Ethernet adapter, and a virtual switch will be created and connected to this Ethernet port. Since we'll talk more about virtual machine networking in a later lesson, let's move on by clicking Next. One of the most powerful features of Hyper-V is live migration, which allows running virtual machines to move from one host to another with no downtime. To participate in live migrations, we need to check the box here that says allow this server to send and receive live migrations of virtual machines. I'll go ahead and check the box, and then the default authentication protocol is CRED SSP. We'll be looking at this later in the live migration lesson, so for now, let's just take the default and click Next. Finally, we're asked where we'd like our virtual machines and virtual machine configuration files to be stored. By default, virtual hard drives go in Users, Public, Documents, Hyper-V, Virtual Hard Disk, and virtual machine configuration files go into Program Data, Microsoft, Windows, Hyper-V. Feel free to change these virtual machine hard drive and configuration file locations to another place on your local C drive or to another physical drive installed in your Hyper-V server. In our case, I'll just take the defaults by clicking Next, which brings us to the confirmation screen. Here we can see that Hyper-V is going to be installed along with the remote server administration tools. Since that's exactly what we want, I'll go down here and click Install to start the installation. It'll take a few minutes to complete, so I'm going to pause the video recording and I'll be right back. After a few files have been copied, it says a restart is pending on the server. You must restart the server to finish the installation. Of course, we could have clicked the checkbox on the previous screen here to automatically restart the server, but I wanted you to see the results here if you did not check the checkbox, because now we need to go down here and click Close, and then let's go ahead and restart it. I'll minimize this. I'll go up here to the top right, go down to Settings. Here's the Power button. I'll click on the Power button, and I'll click Restart. And now our Windows Server 2012 server is restarting. I'll pause the recording and be right back as soon as it's done. Okay, our Windows Server 2012 system has restarted. I logged back in and Server Manager automatically came up. Notice over here now on the left-hand side, we've got a new option that says Hyper-V. If I click on Hyper-V here, I get information about my Hyper-V servers. So far, I just have one server, and to manage this server, I'm going to use Hyper-V Manager. So if I go down to the Start menu, you can see here's the new Hyper-V Manager icon installed on the Start menu. I'll click on Hyper-V Manager, and this brings up the graphical user interface we'll be using throughout this course to administer our Hyper-V server. If I click on Hyper-V 1, which is the server we installed here, we can see so far we don't have any virtual machines, snapshots, and we would use the Actions menu over here to get started. I'll be walking you through how to use HyperManager step-by-step in another lesson, but simply because we can bring up this application and connect to Hyper-V 1, the server we just enabled the Hyper-V role on, we've proven that our installation was successful, and we can go back to our slides. Now before I end this lesson, let me quickly cover a couple of terms that you need to know. They are Hardware Assisted Virtualization and Hardware Enforced Data Execution Prevention. Both of these are features of your CPU, and they're both features that need to be enabled in the BIOS. So first off, make sure that the server that you're purchasing or the server you plan to run Hyper-V on has these features available in the CPU, and they're also enabled in the BIOS. If you're not sure if your CPU supports these features, you can actually go to the server's start menu, go to the computer, right click, go to properties, bring up system information, find out who the manufacturer of your CPU is and what architecture it has, then go out to your favorite search engine and then look that up and see if Intel VT or AMD V and hardware enforced data execution prevention or DEP are actually features of that CPU and that server architecture. Thanks for watching this lesson on installing Windows Server 2012 Hyper-V.